Now I'll hit record and we'll see if it crashes. Okay, welcome everybody to the live session for week four, the end of, okay, let me get the name of this class right because it's like an exceptionally <laughs> long title. Workshop. Writing workshop four, video game and interactive formats, dash, online which doesn't actually mean online formats. It means I'm teaching you online, not in the classroom. So our special guest today, I don't know, does this work for everybody? Is he really on my that? Other side. There we go. <laughs> right, okay. Richard Dansky, oh, we lost somebody. Well, anyway, Richard Dansky is an industry veteran who knows a lot about video game writing and editing. And uh, the term I like best is script doctoring. Um, I think he even wrote the chapter in the book that you guys have for this class called Script Doctoring. Nice. That's a good intro. <laughs> All of my live sessions need a soundtrack. I like that. Okay. Man, we're still missing John. Okay, well, I hope he comes back. But in the meantime, uh, I know I confused you all by sending out an email yesterday. Yes. And some of you sent me lots of questions about it and I'm formulating one monster email with lots of answers and that will go out. I really wanted it to go out before this session, but it didn't. Um, so it'll go out right after the session and it will answer all of your questions. Uh, actually, we'll, what I'll probably do is let Richard Dansky go before it's too late. He, I mean, he does have some cats that will come and eat his face alive if he ignores them for too long. And so uh, we'll let him go and then I'll send the email and then you can all tell me if I don't answer the questions correctly. However, one of the things Richard Dansky sorry, uh, knows a lot about is workshopping as well as working in the game industry. Uh, he has taught a class, session, whatever. How many times have you done it? Like five times? Five or six. I, I yeah. honestly have lost count. It's uh, kind of embarrassing. Is it always Muppetational? Or is it just, you know, workshopping? Muppetational is just the last couple of years. But... Okay. Well, he's super good at teaching people how to workshop. And... Um, this is a perfect fit for this. So I'm going to start out and say, do you guys have questions for Richard? I know last week we spent a lot of time uh, with me telling you great stories about what it's like to be a game writer and how you really get to come in and fix what other people have broken or, you know, created and love and you need to go and help bring it to life. Uh, but I'm not sure he entirely believed me. So here's another guy. Sorry, on this side. On my side, he's here over here. Anyway, Richard Dansky. If you have questions, you can be like, Richard, Wendy said this. Is it really true? Go for it. Got any questions? Anybody? Tori's hand is raised. Oh, go for it, Victoria. Okay, sorry, I don't have the little button to raise my hand. Um, one of the, the biggest questions that I have is, you know, one of the things we're doing throughout our whole program is, you know, building portfolio pieces and, and trying to, you know, get a diverse offering of what we can do for each industry. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I actually, it's funny because last night I, I uh, spoke to Ms. Despain about this. What, if I were to, let's say, get the amazing opportunity to, to come in and interview, 
what would I show you to show tangible evidence that I, one, understand the industry, two, can do it? Like, w what is it piecewise that you'd actually want to see? Yeah, uh, what I would want to see and what I was, what I looked for when I was uh, hiring writers or recommending writers for projects was, and this is going to sound trite, but it's the absolute God honest truth, samples of game writing. Um, it is well and good that you, if you have work in other media that you can show off, particularly if it's published work, particularly if it's gotten some notice, but what you need to demonstrate when you walk in for an interview is that you can do game writing, and that means samples that are in the specific forms that a game is going to use. Um, so that means don't just deliver um, an action sequence script um, or, or a cutscene script. Also deliver systemic dialogue. Um, deliver character or world descriptions that an art team, <clears throat> excuse me, would be able to use. Um, look at what actually goes into a game in terms of the writing and produce pieces that match that. Um, what I always asked for was a three-part writing sample, honestly. Uh, one part was a short scene to show you could write dialogue and blocking. Uh, one part was a page worth of systemic dialogue. Do you guys know what systemic dialogue is? Is that branching or is that triggered? I don't know which one that means. Okay, that is that is triggered by events in the game and happens automatically. Um, how many of you guys play first-person shooters? I have. I have a little. Okay. You, you do not need, need to, you know, tell me you love them or anything like that. Just you played them. What are the what dialogue do you hear the most in a first-person shooter? Ow. <laughs> how many variants do you think there are of ow? Maybe like 50. <laughs> okay, um, you're off by a couple of orders of magnitude. <laughs> That's actually a huge part of the writing. It's an important part of the writing. It's a type of writing that you don't do anywhere but writing for games. So if you can demonstrate to me in your portfolio that you are capable of doing systemic writing and that you understand the job is not just writing the glamorous part of the script and then going you know, your merry way, that demonstrates you understand what a game team is looking for. Um, the absolute best thing you can do, even, is if you get your hands on a toolkit. Um, for years and years, the Bioware toolkits were the, the gold standard for this. Um, and actually putting a little bit of dialogue into a game so it was playable, so you could demonstrate that you, would, you could work with tools and that you could understand how stuff fit into a game. Um, that was the best thing that you could do. But winding back around your original question, the thing you have to have in your portfolio is stuff that evinces an understanding of game writing and the sort of material a game writer is asked to do as opposed to material from other media that might or might not translate. So can I ask you if, I mean, there are lots of uh, different things available today for making your own kind of game. I mean, there's everything from stencil to, I don't know, here's a ton of like, hey, get in here and kind of make your own game. Uh, but what about things like Inkle Writer or uh, Twine, that kind of thing that gives you um, text adventure kind of abilities? Is that something that you would see as a useful piece in your portfolio? Something that's playable is better than something that's not playable, I think. If you can do that, um, I think you know, by demonstrating you're willing to make a game um, you're demonstrating to a game company that you're interested in actually making games, that you're interested in doing the work that goes into game making, um, and that you understand interactivity on a certain level. And I think that's a tremendous thing, a tremendous point in your favor. Okay. All right, we've got Jennifer, I think, is next. Okay. Um, in the, like, in the, the book and everything, when we read it, it says, you know, things like, familiarize yourself with uh, the people you're working with tools and then you said like toolkit what exactly do you mean by that like like they, the books and stuff say make sure you know the designers tools and stuff like that so that you can better write your story for them what exactly are they talking about what that means is that you need to understand what the people you're on the team with are working with and what the limitations and capabilities that they have are. So you don't write something that they can't do, um, or you write something that doesn't match what the game is capable of doing. 
Um, on a base level, that means being able to talk to them about the work they're doing, have, understanding a basic vocabulary of level design, of animation, of uh, the, uh, the systems behind systemic dialogue, things like that. So you can have a conversation, an intelligent conversation back and forth about what pe the people you're working with actually need. Um, and that way you can give them a better um, response to what they need to make their part of the work good. Um, okay. If you can actually get your hands on the tools that they're using, whether it's um, looking at you know the the scripting tools or things like that, the actual stuff they're using when the rubber hits the road to make the game, that's even better. But on a base level, you should be able to walk over to the other members of the team whose work is touching yours and have a conversation that is mutually comprehensible to both of you. Um, understanding the basic vocabulary of the other aspects of the game development team. So, in some ways, getting at least familiar with things like... Um, the reason we can't be more specific with this answer and say, oh, you need to learn this program, this program, and this program, is that every game studio has their own tools. So... Um, every team within a studio sometimes has their own yes. tools. Well, you just actually said it, you said, they're, but they're programs, so you have to know what the capabilities of the specific program are, because if yes. you're working with program A, it may not have the capability to do, like, um, 3D CG or, or anything like that, or they could be working with a, a 2D model, so you have to keep it visually 2D when you're, when you're writing. Exactly. You, okay. you okay. should, you know, walking out of the project, when you become a part of the team, you should have, you know, a good idea of what the game is, how it's going to look, how it's going to play, how it's going to work, how big it's going to be, how much work you're going to be doing, um, all the details of the game. Um, and understanding those parameters go a long way towards being able to do your job well. And then the next level down, like, as Wendy says, um, the tools that people use to actually make the game vary from company to company, from studio to studio within a company, from project to project within a single studio. Um, frequently they get customized to Hell and Gone um, to meet the specific needs of a project. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an infinite list of tools that are out there. Um, and you don't need to know every one. You don't need to know exactly how to do everything at every single one of them. Uh, you need to know what the team you're working with can do and can't do um, and what they need you to do to match what they're doing. So there's no need for you to learn coding. Um, if you know a little bit, great. That's you know that'll help you talk to the engineers. Um, but you do need to understand that that's the language that the engineers you're working with are going to be using, and you need to be able to come to a meeting point where you can understand them and they can understand you. One of the ways to do that is to learn um, some of the. There are a couple of standards out there that are getting used a lot that are uh, Unity is a program that if you knew just your basic way around Unity, that could give you some of these. Victoria, yes, that's what, Unity, that's it. Uh, the other one is the Unreal Engine, but these are pretty, uh, they can be daunting. And the most important thing to be able to do is to learn software quickly. That's that's more important than knowing any one particular software piece is not being afraid to sit down and say, okay, you've got this program that you built from scratch, art department, that's cool. You know, let me sit down in front of it for half an hour and play around with it and have somebody I can ask questions, say, is this what we're doing? Is this how it works? And if you can do that, that's the skill that is really useful because it's going to be different everywhere you work. But another great way to learn some of that uh, lingo and some of those how to talk to people about what they're talking about in their world is to go to conferences. I think I mentioned go conferences maybe last week, maybe before. There are a ton of game conferences out there. One coming near you wherever you are at some point in the year. So go to that conference and go to as many sessions as you can and not necessarily just the sessions about story and games because if you can sit in on a session 
that's all intended and aimed at programmers, you'll learn a lot about how they talk to each other and how to talk to them. At first, it might sound like they're talking complete gibberish, and you might have to take a while to be like, oh, I'm in a new country here. I need to learn the basics. But um, eventually, you know, immersion language learning. You go sit in on enough of those sessions and you start to pick it up. Okay. I'm also a big fan of just walking over to the other people and team and say, okay, what do you need from me? Um, yeah, that's the luxury you have when you're on staff somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah is sitting down with this specific person that you're talking to, saying, hey, let's have a conversation, going out to lunch, talking to them like real people. Absolutely. And even if you're not on site, if you stay in touch, you know, over IM, if you stay in touch through email, just keeping up the communication so you're not siloing your work. So you don't, you know, if there's a misunderstanding as to what the limitations you're working with are, you don't run off to the weeds and do endless hours of work that's not going to match the technical specs of the game. Yeah, it often helps to just kind of say, hey, I want to do this. Is that going to make you guys crazy? And you can kind of look on the look on their face of, don't do that. Yeah, or, oh, yeah, sure, we can do that. You know, they may be lying with that second part, but you'll find out soon enough. Okay, I think that Victoria is next on the questions. Do you still remember your question, Victoria? Um, I think, hang on, I, mean, I think I remember it. Oh yeah, um, because you were talking about, <laughs> sorry, you, you were talking about there being different formats and every every place is different and, and then being able, you um, you were saying to be able to show an example that I know system, systemic dialogue and that I can do a world description. Just, this sounds really elementary, but visually, what format am I, like I, when I was in, um, my pins class, we learned to do the dialogue using Excel and showing, you know, it it moving. How visually should it be presented to you to show that one, I understand it, and two, I know how to deliver it. Um, Until I learn what your company, how your company does it, what can I show you walking in the door? What I always like to see was a script format, um, simply because I had worked on games that had, you know. 17,000 lines of dialogue in an Excel spreadsheet, and so that always gave me the vapors when I saw the dialogue in Excel after that. Um, but hey, if you were in in one of the samples was an Excel spreadsheet with some dialogue in it, it you'd be, be okay. like, yes, I get that. that. It's readable, it's clear, you understand what you're doing. The reason people chose the game dialogue in Excel for so long is that it was great for data wrangling, um, not so great for composition, but wonderful for data wrangling the dialogue. And if you do it in an Excel spreadsheet and you demonstrate the understand, okay, it's in the Excel spreadsheet because it needs to have the animations attached and the sound file attached and the localization, the foreign language versions of the line attached and all that, and you set it up like that, you're demonstrating you understand, you know, that you are building a game asset, not a piece of undying prose that will live forever in the sparkling firmament of the heavens. And that is a good thing. But also having um, something in dot in screenplay format, that's a good thing to have too, right? Yes, if you're doing a cutscene, for example, putting that in screenplay format, um, you know, we are getting to a place where so many um, cutscenes, so many games are done in full performance capture, where you have the actors reading the lines while they're in the full uh, motion capture suit, that you do need the blocking, you do need the uh, the stage direction there. Oops. Keep on fading out. Um, and so demonstrating you can do that as well is a very valuable thing. Um, I, I will throw in a uh, quantitative, qualitative tidbit here as opposed to the quantitative stuff, which is that um, if you are right, producing a sample of game writing, shorter is always better. Um, maybe not the length of the sample, but the length of the individual lines. Um, if you monologue in game writing, you are risking losing the player immediately. And if you are monologuing in a sample that shows you, you know, you at your best game writing, then you are potentially saying, okay, I'm thinking my writing is more important than the game action. And that's not necessarily a good impression to make. Gotcha. So you're a great okay. professor to Spain. 
I do keep telling them, hey, short, short, it needs to be short. And they're all, but all of our other classes, it gets longer and longer and longer. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, with video game writing, it starts small. Hey, we've got a small idea. And then you go and you do a lot of research. And then you have to combine it, make it small again, so that you can convey it to people. Yep. Um, and really get everyone on board with your idea without making them read a document that's that thick. Yes. Um, and then it does balloon again at the end when you're writing 500 different ways of saying ow. Yeah. Yes, it happens. And to think about those ways of saying ow, okay. Ow is a perfect bit of systemic dialogue. It conveys all the information it needs to in two letters, right? Mm -hmm. Ow. I'm hurt. Right? Ow. Oops, stupid wrong. So, com and you're going to hear that ow a hundred times during the game, right? Mm -hmm. 100, 200. It's never going to get old because it's, you know, it's elegant, it's short, you're not going to get bored with it. Everybody says ow. Mm -hmm. If, however, you write, oh my goodness, I have been shot and I think I am bleeding. <laughs> Imagine hearing that a hundred times during a game in 12 different voices. <laughs> it's going to turn into a drinking game very quickly. <laughs> It's actually already turned into a meme. Somebody did this already. And I think probably, uh, who was it I was talking to who confessed? I think it's Jennifer. Mm -hmm. We'll recognize, yes, I used to be an adventurer. And then I took an <laughs> arrow to the knee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. It's Moretta who yeah, came up not with me. that one. <laughs> Well, it was you know, one time dialogue, di you know, detail is great, it's distinctive, yeah. it's wonderful, but stuff that's going to be heard over and over again, short, sweet, to the point, convey the information. There are times and places to get, you know, to, to let your flag fly, and there are times and places where doing that is the absolute worst thing you can possibly do. You'll become the laughing stock of the internet. Yay! I'm sure the person who wrote that line is oh so pleased that it's become such a joke. Hey, Richard, do you know who wrote that line? I do not know who wrote that line. I don't either. They haven't fessed up. <laughs> Nor will they ever. I suspect you're right. I don't. We'll have to get um, like every game writer we know really drunk in, until someone confesses to having written that line. Anyway, it is a very good example of why sometimes <clears throat> is better than I used to be an adventurer until I took an arrow to the knee. So All right. <laughs> I know. Well, poetry isn't necessarily the place if you want to be, I mean, if you want to be a game writer, poetry isn't necessarily going to be a great place, except occasionally you'll get huge chunks of text on loading screens where you have to write, you know, quotes of the ages from some sage that never existed. Sounds like... Sounds like Yoda, but... Uh... Yeah. Well, I was trying to go for Confucius, but maybe, maybe you work on better games than I do, my friend. Oh, okay. I, I, when I was working on uh, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, I had a poster note on my mom that just read, Don't be Yoda. Don't be Yoda. You're trying to do the deliberate archives, and you 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 slip into the backwards phrasing and the yeah. unnecessary these and thous very quickly, and it sound it looks great on the page, and it sounds terrible. So. That's a very good point. We did have one assignment about figuring out what dialogue to use and what ne what dialogue not to use, and um, like how to sound like a cop without sounding like a fake cop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, real, realism versus believability in dialogue. Um, something that I, I deal with a lot when I'm working on the Tom Clancy game. <laughs> um, whereby, you know, obviously when we're working on the Clancy games, we want the uh, the stuff the soldiers and the secret agents um, are saying to sound realistic and to sound authentic and for you know you to hear that and think, yeah, these guys sound right, that's what they'd say in that situation, that they're absolutely you know, nailing that and selling you the fantasy of being in that world. Unfortunately, if you get too accurate, 
um, it doesn't resonate because our ideas of what that dialogue sounds like come as much from TV and movies and comic books and whatever else. Um, and so we have a visceral understanding of what those guys sound like, which may or may not have anything to do with what they actually do sound like. Um, and so you frequently have to dial back the absolute realism uh, to make a more believable voice, a voice that people will understand instinctively to be a soldier or a secret agent or a cop or a firefighter or a chef or whoever, um, because if you use the actual stuff, the jargon is simply too dry, too complex, and it doesn't meet player expectations. Yeah, and most of the military people I know speak in so many, like, shorthand, they, like, it's all letters, and it doesn't it's make any acronyms, sense. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me as a human being. Yeah, we, um, we, we very carefully ration our acronyms on a lot of things. <laughs> you have a limit on them. Um, when I'm working on a game that, and, and really writing dialogue for, for characters and things, I print out character sheets that have their description and their photo, art, whatever, um, and some shorthand, like, really quick little things to remember about them. Like you were saying, don't sound like Yoda. I have a little thing for each one of them that is, uh, helps me remember how to write for them. And uh, I tend to put it up around my desk so that they're all surrounding me, literally staring at me as I write their dialogue. So, I don't know, that's one of the quirky things that game writers do. Um, yeah, I do the, what I call the 10 words exercise which is that when I'm writing a character, I'll write down, in addition to their bio and their distinguishing characteristics, and whatever else, um, five words that they will use and that nobody else gets to use in the game, and five words that they will absolutely never use. Um, and that does a lot, one, to help solidify the character in your mind. Uh, think about the choices that you make to uh, say, okay, this person would talk like this, wouldn't talk like that. Um, that really helps you understand the character better. And two, it helps make those character voices more distinctive. In video games, you know, we need every bit of assistance we can get to make our characters distinctive um, because we still haven't gotten to the point where the things that, you know, we instinctively recognize as making human beings distinctive, you know, they're not quite there yet in the game world. We haven't quite crossed the uncanny bound. Um, so if I can make a character's voice that much more distinctive, you hear word and you instinctively know that it is this particular character, um, then I'm helping the characterization, I'm helping myself, and I'm helping you enjoy the game better. He doesn't even need to be on screen for you to know who's talking, if he's got a characteristic voice. All right, I think I saw somebody else with a question. Got to scroll up. That's me. All right, as long as you're not jumping the line, I don't think you are. Go for it, what's your question? Okay. Um Richard, I actually, I, uh, I've played a couple of the games that you've worked on, and, um, like, Red Steel and Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. I really liked the Dark Messiah one, but, um, I noticed that you did the dialogue for the Red Steel game, but then you did world design and writing for Dark Messiah. Yes. And so my question for you is that, um, which one of those would you say is more pertinent to develop and which one is like more complicated like is there is there a style of writing that as a video game writer we would need to focus on more the bulk of the work you're going to be doing is going to be more related to day-to-day -day project stuff so that would be dialogue uh, that would be writing in-game artifacts that would be helping out with in-game text you know all the achievements and the menu text um, and the stuff that, you know, the subtitles, things like we, that. Just so you know, Richard, we made them write achievements and they, I don't think they liked that okay. assignment very much, but we, yes. uh, <laughs> so, so thank if you. you have an achievement that sounds bad, it's worse than a, a systemic dialogue that sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, that's but true. That's out there, you know, people are going to be actively trying to get the goofy one. Um, and having it show up for all of their friends to see, yes. So world building is a related but distinct set of skills, um, what had happened there was that um, the, the the Might and Magic universe was sort of getting rebooted, um, and so that that was where my involvement came in. I used to work in tabletop role playing. Um, if you've seen people hanging around coffee houses dressed as vampires and doing this and pretending not to be there, 
that's partially my fault. Um, and so I had experience building worlds and building that kind of setting, and it's a very different um, sort of exercise than writing the dialogue that is tailored to specific moments in a game. It is a wonderful tool set to have. It is increasingly important as we go forward with transmedia um, because you know it's the one world that's going to be in the game and the comic books and the novels and whatever else. Um, and being able to do that is extremely useful if you're coming in on that side. But the day-to-day -day opportunities to do that are rarer than opportunities to actually work on a team working with dialogue and in-game text and on-screen elements. Writing those 500 lines of, ow, are the entry-level kind of place that most people start. Is that right? Depends. Um, the, the companies that have writing teams, um, they tend to sort of, it, again, it varies studio to studio, project to project. I know, I'm sorry. Um, there's no way to say there's one true way of what is an entry level job. It doesn't exist. But I will tell you that just today, like one of the things that delayed my getting this email sent out to all of you is that a game developer got me on Skype and said, uh, hey, Wendy, not that I'm going to hire you to do this, but I need you to find me a writer who can do this. I'm like, okay, what is this? I, I need 10,000, and yes, you heard that correctly, 10,000 multiple choice questions about soccer <laughs> by the end of August. <laughs> And I should say, <laughs> yes, you Victoria. I was going to say, well, I recommended Andy. <laughs> and I should also clarify, he did not actually ask if I knew somebody who could uh, write questions for soccer. He asked if I knew who could write questions for football. And... Uh, he said it with a British accent, and so I knew he was actually asking about soccer and not American football. And so I did, I sent him to Andy and Morris. And uh, if you have another suggestion, do let me know, because I have no idea if those two are at all like sports oriented. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know, ask those guys, they'll tell you who. But David, that's. David, David, David. <laughs> Your, your husband's available, Victoria. That's <laughs> well. Football or soccer, he could do all of them. He's he probably heard you and is working on it now. That's, right. That's, you just described his dream job. <laughs> wow, uh, <laughs> takes all kinds to make a world. <laughs> Have him send me an email. Somebody is looking for that literally today. Um, uh, and then he was asking me how much it would cost, and I was like, well, don't don't hire somebody less than this, because they'll give you crap if you pay them less than this. Anyway, mm, the fun jobs that game writers get to do. Um, it's stuff like this coming out of the blue completely, and you yeah. know, whether, whether you're a freelance or you're internal, um, the stuff that shows up... Um, can, can be that level of wacky. It can be, hey, we need, you know, 10,000 ARGs. It can be, um, you know, hi, we're, we're going to the studio on Thursday. Could you please take a look at our script, um, which mostly isn't written yet. <laughs> oh, we haven't got to the ending yet. Could you help us out with that? Mm -hmm. um, Flexibility is a very important skill to cultivate. <laughs> Uh, Victoria, no, this is not, you don't know Jack. Sorry. It's, it's not a known IP. Um, flexibility. Yes. I wanted to focus on that because, um, one of the things about games is that it is ever changing and people are always coming up with brand new ways of, Hey, let's do game like this. Let's do a game like this. Let's do a game like this. And so uh, if you can show that you can be flexible with lots of different ways of writing and lots of different ideas, um, 
I don't remember if I told you guys my story about having to come up with, I, I promised three to five great ideas to fix this horrible problem within three hours. Uh, I came up with four. <laughs> I was really aiming for that number five and I failed within the three hours that they gave me. Um, but yeah, they brought me in and said, we've already fired four writers. And the reason we fired the last guy is that we realized that nothing made sense. So we've got the game entirely built. All of the art is finished. Uh, all of the gameplay mechanics are done. It's all there. We just don't have words to go and put in the characters' mouths. And we definitely don't have like any reason why people who are dressed in Victorian clothing are doing time travel in gardens. We don't know what, how. it doesn't make sense. Nobody knows why. Nobody, steampunk, yes. Well, that, it did end up going there. But the point is, they were like, we don't know what's going on. And so help us in as fast as possible because we have to launch this very, very soon. So, um, yeah, I said, okay, now I'm aware of the situation and what it was that you didn't like about the last one people's ideas and so go away and come back in three hours and I'll have between three and five ideas that we can talk about and uh, they came back and I presented four ideas um, one of them involved Jane Austen in a school a finishing school setting because you know Jane Austen's a time traveler um, and the other one was something more along the lines of it'll be gossipy and uh, what was that show? I want to tell my mind now. The Real Housewives of no, the other one, the fake one. <laughs> Desperate Housewives. There we go. Okay. Anyway. So I was like, hey, we've got Desperate Housewives, we've got Jane Austen, we've got, you know, so I'm, I'm giving them log lines and explanations for how each of these elements fit in. And in the end, they didn't pick any one of my four ideas, but they did decide they liked elements of two of my ideas and we could combine them into one and move forward with that new hybrid, I won't say Frankenstein idea, it was great, it's fine been actually quite popular and yet I don't get any credit for it because I was just contractor brought in for a few days to fix it but that's how it goes in the game industry um all right not to keep Richard Dansky too long Quick, are there any last questions for him or some of you did send some work for him to look at. So do we want to go there now or do you have other questions for him? I'm hearing silence, the crickets. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I actually sent a piece of writing of mine to Richard Dansky. Oh, he's over there for you guys. I sent him one of mine and I am guessing he picked it right out of the bunch, even though my name's on it. <laughs> Although I suspect he may not have actually read the names on the papers, but uh, I am going to offer myself up first to say, hey, Richard Dansky, that's my pitch for a game. Um, I am going to see if I can, no, I'm not. I'm just gonna see if you can give me feedback quickly. And if it turns out that it will help if I could bring it up on my screen and show it to everybody, I'll figure out how to do that. But let's start out. Okay. Um, yeah, if we, if we can do that, if you get, you know, share it around with them afterwards, that'd be cool. Um, right. Well, I'll so work on I that over, one. I read over Choice of the Paladin, and I have a few notes on it. Excellent. Um, Thank you. So starting in the beginning, <clears throat> who is the hero of this game? <laughs> this should be an easy question. You are the hero of this game. 
yes, the player is always the hero. Um, the player may put on the guise of the uh, the viewpoint character, but the player is always the hero. And as such, the thing that your story pitch needs to really lay out there is what is the player going to be doing um, and what is their journey along the way? What are they striving to reach? How do they get there? Um, that, that very simple throughput of why is this an appealing fantasy for me to put on? Why do I want to? Why would someone want to play this character? And so what we have here, we start with you are a paladin, a warrior priest. We get a little bit of the backstory, um, but then it sort of goes into a little bit of little bit of game flow. Then it goes into a little bit of world building, and then it goes into some very detailed world building, and then it sort of comes back to what the ultimate goal is. And that's a little bit disorganized. Um, okay. What I would do with this pitch is get right front and center who the player is supposed to be, why it is good to be that character, why this is an interesting character to play, what is unique about them, what they are striving for, and they hinted how they're going to get there. The interesting thing they're going to do to reach that goal. And then you can start in on the world building. Um, you know, getting it out, you sink the hook in with you are a paladin, a, you know, a former mercenary who has raised themselves up. You are trusted with guiding the princess through the forest of your nature goddess, but something's wrong. You set up your conflict there. Um, she needs to come into her own power as a force for good as opposed to being just a political pawn. You need to help her do that. At the same time, keeping her safe from the giant wolves and nomads and um, flailing ukulele beasts and whatever else is in there. And yes. just package that up at the very beginning. Um, make it attractive right off the bat to be this character. Make this character cool and interesting. Make the people who are going to be looking at this, who are going to be getting 10,000 ideas from everyone on the team, want to keep reading yours. So the, just because I got a little distracted as I was trying to bring it up. Can everybody see it now? No. It's too small for everyone to see or not even. I only see you two. Mm -hmm. No screens. Can you see it now? Nope. Nope. Huh. Well, all right then. We'll do it the old fashioned way. Here. Quick, right over to the photocopier. <laughs> okay, not quite that old fashioned. One project I was on, I was ordered by the producer to have a copy of the full script with me at all times. This was roughly 1,200 pages of dialogue. Um, so I literally, I was walking around with a carton. Um, I was going to say. About 60 pounds of paper um, everywhere I went. I, I went out to dinner. I had this thing with me. I went to go grocery shopping. I had this thing with me. In your and backpack? At the end of that project, my nickname was Hates Trees. Wow. So. Okay, can everybody see it now? No. Mm -mm. Still see you too. I think you have to share your desktop with us. Well, I thought I was. Okay. Maybe you can't birds. do a picture and that at the same time. Uh -huh. If you go up to the menu bar up top with go to meeting, yes. do, do, do you see the drop down of um, dual share screen and Webcam? No. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, preferences? Oh, sorry, mine just turned on. Woo see, I, I have the option, but I'm not I'm not the presenter organizer, so I can't do it. Okay, tell me again where to go. It's under um, go to meeting and yes. then um, under preferences, you should have the option to do a uh, share uh, screen. They've done a terrible usability thing and then like, sorry, go sorry. ahead. So under usability, under go to meeting, I see general. Oh, see, I don't see general on mine. Recordings. Okay, Meetings. we're seeing different, maybe I have a different version. Sorry. Uh, well, I did tell you. I have a completely different drop down menu. Attendees can chat. Attendees can view attendees list. Attendees can share webcams. Let's 
stop sharing my webcam. Hi, webcam. It showed it easily the last time. Of course, the last time it also crashed. Uh, Or it can go to meetings show more than two uh, things at once. Like there's because both of them are on a screen. Maybe that's why it won't show. Yeah, hers, um, go, well, no, cameras. Can no, go to meeting is actually meant for that. You can have up to okay. nine webcams going and okay. have visuals. Okay. I, I just I'm okay. seeing a different drop down menu than her. So I don't know if we're on different versions. So are you seeing a black background behind our two lovely faces? Yes. Well, I actually see the stuff in both of your rooms. <laughs> she, she means behind that. Yeah, it's I like can a get out of the way so you can see the, book, the covers of the books that I released this year. So. Oh, okay. Very nice. <laughs> nice plugging. <laughs> we all get discounts, right? Absolutely. Well, there's only three of us. We should get them for free. I'm just saying. No. Oh! <laughs> nice plugging. Go, Jenny. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Oh, it's there gone. Minute, minute. <laughs> do it again. Do it again. You had it. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. See all sorts yeah. of things. Whole bunch of things. There. <laughs> okay. Can you see Richard? Yes. You have, yes. You can see everything. And you. And me. Okay. Well, yeah. on my screen, I'm totally covering up Richard, but. Uh, anyway, this is what he's talking about. Okay. Um, and what he was saying was the main problem, if I remember correctly, is that I cram world building right in the middle of the action. Is that right? Yes. You started with a hook, then you went to some world building, then you went to some plot stuff, then you went back to a little bit more of the hook, and then you went very granular with the, uh, the world building. And it's just not structured in a way that flows naturally. Um, it makes sense in my own head. No, okay, so absolutely, <laughs> you hear that a lot, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, everybody, see, even pros need this. Mm -hmm. Like, I need somebody else to look at it and say, "Oh, actually, Wendy, this could be much better structured," because mm -hmm. it it gets you go all over the place, and it was very. I freely admit it was very extremist conscious. You know, I'm just getting it out on the page, and there it is done. Uh, and so it's very helpful to have a reader or two who can look at it and say, you had me in the first sentence, and then you lost me because I got bored. <laughs> or whatever. He said it much more nicely than that. But Okay. Uh, there, there are things you pick up and then, then you drop and you don't develop them fully. There's nomads in the forest, but you sort of, you bring them up and then you sort of let them float away. You say you're going to help the princess, but there's not really a lot of detail of how that journey happens. Um, she is clearly going to be the second most important character in this game, but she's always spoken of as the object. Um, more of her screen, more of her on screen to explain why she's interesting and worth developing and you know, worth protecting um, who she is. I think would go a long way as well. So I have um, a question for you because okay. this is an actual pitch that I am actually pitching to someone. I was asked to pitch. And part of the requirement is that this secondary character, the princess, mm -hmm. um, be either male or female, depending on choices made by the character the player mm -hmm. so in my head i'm imagining different personalities if it's a male prince than if it's a female princess so how do i condense that down into a one-page pitch when that's fairly complicated you still Regardless of the details of the personality, they're still going to be taking the same journey from mm -hmm. someone who doesn't want to be along on this thing, who is 
possibly a spoiler who's essentially baggage to an active contributor in yes. what's going on. Yeah. So you focus on that arc. Okay. Um, it's Instead the, of in the details of their personality, the really granular stuff that doesn't need to be in here. The interesting thing is where they start and where they end up, and calling that out. Um, you don't need to have a whole lot of details, but the arc yeah. has to be interesting. And, and call and calling that out in the same. Um, calling that out within the same. <laughs> paragraph at least instead of you know way up here at the top and then oh by the way here at the bottom mm -hmm. this is the arc I was looking for. Well let me turn the question around to you. What's the most important thing in this pitch? The main character, right? The experience of the main character getting to feel like they are in this world and making choices that matter. Okay. But that, that's about three answers in one. The first thing that's going to hook is, you're, you're, it's a story pitch here. Yes. The first thing that, the, the most important thing is the main character. Then ask yourself what's next most important, the world or the second character? And yeah. build yeah. those elements in progression of most importance down to, okay, this has to be in there, but... If I put up front, they're going to go TLDR and move on to the next pitch. So pr prioritizing the elements of your pitch is very important, and being willing to ruthlessly cut out elements of your pitch um, is important but as well. I personally am more interested in the world, mm -hmm. but you are absolutely right that the player will be more interested and the people deciding if you got this pitch or not would be more interested in the secondary character. Okay. Now it is, I see potentially strong elements of the world, you know, there's some interesting stuff. Um, the question that I would ask then, looking at those elements are, why are these people supposed to be interesting to me? Why are they interesting adversaries? Why is this in, you know, what makes this different from 93,000 other Tolkien ripoffs? Yep. Um, you say, you know, there's nomads, they're in the forest, and they have big dogs. Yep. That is basically what we've got from them. Yes. Build them more, a little more mystery, a little more, okay, you know, if there's an ambiguous relationship where they could be antagonists or allies, bring that out. If they have particularly unique behaviors or their own goals, even if you don't know what they are, be hinted that they've got a mysterious goal of their own, that automatically makes them more interesting than just, these guys are now camping in the forest. Having some yep. agency there and yep. giving, implying that they have an arc as well uh, makes them more attractive and less like, okay, we're, we're just back filling in the space here. Okay. Because once again, that's another case of they do have a very specific arc. I left it out because I couldn't figure out how to fit it in. But I highly recommend figuring out how to fit it in. Okay, now, uh, two other students sent in material to be looked at, and one of them is here and one of them is not. So, Jennifer, now that you've experienced what it's like to get feedback and workshops from the Richard Dansky, would you want his feedback privately in an email, or would you brave enough to have it be uh, I think I kind of prefer it in the email. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I'm this is the that. first time is going to be, you know, like fed back to me. So probably best that way. I understand. That's exactly why I wanted you to see um, what it's like for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like he's, he's not... He's not going to be nicer to me just because. Right. No, right. He's not, and, but he's the next guy. He'll give you good feedback. Okay. <laughs> and he he, he won't rip out your soul. I promise. He only that, he only gives other people the uh, handbooks for how to rip out souls. <laughs> In coffee shops while they're drinking. Okay. 
Well, and the other person isn't here. It was, um, what's his name? Let's see, that would be Mr. Cox. Yes. Okay. If you want to send him to me over email, I will be happy to discuss with him as well. Um, yep. Yeah. I'll introduce I, it to you by email. I will say giving good critique is something that is a vanishingly rare skill in the industry, um, particularly when it comes to writing, simply because there aren't a lot of people who speak the professional language of writing. Uh, they may mean well, they may want to offer feedback, but just as, you know, artists have a professional vocabulary, um, you know, we writers have a professional vocabulary as well that not necessarily a lot of people on the team will have. And if you're on a large team, there are a lot of artists who all speak the same language. There aren't necessarily going to be a lot of writers whom you can go to who will understand the craft to a level where they can give you technique uh, critique as opposed to, I liked it, I didn't like it. Um, could we add some more zombies? Yes. So, yeah. so part of it, uh, when it comes to working on a team of people who are not writers, um, part of the skill that you need to develop is really asking questions and saying, okay, you say you need more zombies. <laughs> Let's talk about where you think we need more zombies. What is it that made you think you needed more zombies? And getting them to talk more about where this is coming from and not necessarily the solution that they are proposing so that you know whether adding more zombies is the right thing to do. Sometimes it is. And um, sometimes the solution is somewhere else and you can be like, oh no, no zombies in this world, sorry. Yeah, sometimes more zombies means, okay, I, we need uh, something to spice up the sequence. Sometimes more zombies means um, I don't like this character and want something to happen to them. Yeah. Some, you know, continually asking questions and getting feedback from folks who aren't um, other writers is, is really good for getting critique on your work. At the same time, building the tools for your own self-critique or being able to offer good critique to other writers you'll be working with is incredibly valuable. Um, like I said, I've been doing this 14 years. And I show everything I write to another writer in the building at Red Storm. A lot of times, uh, somebody in the Paris office. Uh, I've got friends at other studios throughout Ubisoft um, that I bounce things off of, particularly if it's something that I'm not sure of, um, or if it's something that I'm very sure of, because I know that you know. I, I, it's very I love to this. Me. It's awesome. Now tell me. I better why. get somebody else to look at this. Yeah. Right <laughs> Do good. Wait a minute. Um, <laughs> but finding people who can give you good critique. Um, who will be critiquing the work, not you, who will comment on your writing, not rewrite it the way they would have done it, and who will try and figure out what you're actually trying to get to and give you feedback in that direction as opposed to making assumptions. Um, that, that is really, really important to get no matter what level of game writing you're working on. Don't be proud. <laughs> no. And, and don't be too attached to... Uh, I worked on one game where I had to cut literally half the dialogue out of it in two weeks before we went into the studio. Uh, it's something like, God, I don't even remember how much dialogue, but we had thousands of lines of dialogue that needed to go in those two weeks, and they were tied into our puzzle system. So cutting a line of dialogue also meant rewriting, rewriting puzzles. puzzles and yeah. But I did it because that's what the game needed. We didn't have enough disc footprint for all that dialogue. The dialogue had to go. And how long did you have that? Two weeks? I had two weeks. And I had a wall of Diet Coke cans this high on my desk, but I got it done. <laughs> yeah, we ask our students to learn a lot in a month. And uh, I, I kind of hate to tell them that with game writing, it really, really fits, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, a month to develop an entire story? Excellent. <laughs> No, I've, I've Kill it. Where, you know, story developing the story took six months. Um, I was gonna say I am also just kind of an on-call whenever they have the money to work on this game that they love. It is an object of you know. Sometimes they'll have a publisher who wants it made, and then that'll get dropped. And then, 
but they, you know, they still love this game. They want this game to come out. So I started working on it in 2008, 2008. And I still have that game's Bible, series Bible, concept Bible, because it's a follow-up game to another game that had another game that came out that was set in the same universe. And so I'm kind of tying everything together. And well, we made, almost got this game published and then it got canceled at the last second, but they don't want to throw away all the work we did on backstory there. So they want to fit that backstory into the history of this anyway. It's a big legacy and it's been going still on my desktop so um yeah someday i hope they do get to make their dream game and i hope that all the hard work that i put into it gets out there for people to see but you also as a game writer you end up doing a lot of work that people never get to see because games get canceled or they, somebody decides they don't like your work. Like I said, I got hired for that one job where they'd already fired four writers. Well, those four writers didn't get any of their work in the game, so, yeah. But you yeah. still get to put all that on like your resume and everything though. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to be careful about doing that because um, Titles in the game industry are a little bit fluid, and who ends up in the credits is a little bit fluid. Um, like I said, I'm not credited on that game. There's another game that I worked for for Ubisoft that I'm not allowed to ever admit that I worked on. Um, but there are other games that I very, you know, my name's there in the credits. If you sit through the credits at the end of the game, there it is. Um, so my list of credits on my resume that I hand out has, you know, okay, so I was this, in this game and this on this game and this on this game, but, um, in the game industry, a lot of people know that games get canceled or, um, team members come and go. And so some people who are unethical and don't do this. This is me saying, don't do this. Some people take credit for writing they didn't do. And so they will say, I, you know, God of War, that was mine, right there. Or, I, I mean, one of the people that I follow on Facebook, who is a game industry luminary, Whenever she's hiring somebody, um, you can tell she's going through uh, resumes because she'll post, oh, hey, today I found out that, you know, so-and-so is was the lead designer on this game that I was lead designer on. <laughs> but in their resume, they say, lead designer on this game, where she was actually the lead designer. So, um, some people try to pad their resume with, credits because they do know that this happens in the industry where, you know, my name won't show up on that particular project. But if you go ask people who actually worked on the project, hey, did Wendy Despain ever show her face? They will say, yes, she helped us out in this way. And um, yeah, so lecturing you about not lying on your resume. So do you have any other questions? I know Victoria's got to leave. It's 9.13. We've all been here for an hour. That was all that was required. I hope we've covered most of questions. Okay, what we'll do at this moment in time is say goodbye to Richard Dansky. Good night. Thank you very much for coming. Bye. Unless Thank you. he's got any final parting words. Thank you so much. Wisdom to share with the up and coming writers of tomorrow. 
It was my pleasure. Uh, Wendy, please feel free to share my email address if folks have questions they didn't think of tonight that you want to bounce off me. You know, by all means, please feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to uh, okay. answer whatever. Your Gmail address? Yep. Thank you. Okay. I'll send it out. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Good night. He's a zombie for a few minutes while he tries to leave. Okay. I am also going to stop recording. So that doesn't mean you all have to leave. But we're now ending our broadcast day here at